Well, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here uh, uh, for, this, for this panel on the future of cities. Uh, I'm glad that we have uh, a fairly robust audience on an otherwise snowy day with the federal government closed. Uh, so kudos for, for being able to, to attend. Uh, and, and for those of you uh, who think I'm Steve Clemens, I'm actually Steve Feldstein. Uh, standing in for him, I'm shorter, not quite as good looking, but nonetheless happy to be here. Um, I want to recognize a few people in the Atlantic Council, uh, especially on the urban front. Peter Engelke, a senior fellow here, uh, Banning Garrett, uh, Barry Pavel, of course, director of the Scowcroft Center, uh, and Carlos Castello, who uh, really helped to organize things. Uh, and, and I think you know, this panel comes at a really apt moment uh, when it comes to the role of cities and how they will transform international governance. Uh, we already know that we are living in an, area, an era of unprecedented urbanization and interconnectedness. Uh, we are an estimated 180,000 people move into cities each day. Uh, urban areas are expected to gain 1.4 billion people by 2030. Economic activities in cities account for roughly 70% of global uh, of GDP. Uh, and approximately 1 billion people live in slums, and that number is expected to double uh, by 2030. Uh, in fact, over 1.2 million kilometers of land equal to the size of South Africa uh, will likely be converted from rural to urban by 2030. So we know that there are, there are, the implications are significant, that cities really stand as the primary engines and at the crossroads of economic growth and innovation. Uh, but there's also a range of challenges that uh, I'm hoping we can discuss with our illustrious panel today. Everything from climate change and resource scarcity, poverty, political instability, and even terrorism. Uh, so the interesting paradox uh, as well is that even while, while urban growth remains a primary locally, local challenge, the global implications of cities are increasingly apparent. And we really need to find a way to balance uh, effective urban planning with economic constraints, resource scarcity with increased populations, and market growth with systemic poverty. Uh, meeting those challenges, I'm sure, will require new forms of cooperation uh, among megacities with the potential for new and innovative power structures to emerge out of that cooperation. We have an all-star cast with us today who will help us explore these ideas. Uh, first, Dr. Tim Campbell, um, chairman of the Urban Age Institute, sitting in the, in the middle. He's worked for more than 35 years in urban development with experience in multiple countries and hundreds of cities. Uh, his areas of expertise include city learning and exchange, strategic urban planning, and the social and poverty impact of urban development. Uh, Dr. Campbell retired from the World Bank in 2005 after more than 17 years, holding positions including head of the World Bank Institute urban team and head of the urban partnership, uh, which is responsible for developing new bank products and services for cities. Uh, next, we have Greg Lindsay uh, over in the far left. Uh, he's the senior fellow uh, from the World Policy Institute, where he's a co-director on the Emergent Cities uh, Project. He's also a contributing writer for Fast Company and co-author of Aerotropolis, The Way We'll Live Next. Uh, he's a visiting scholar at New York University's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, and he's also a research affiliate of the New England Complex Systems Institute. Uh, he, is involved, uh, he has advised multiple companies, Intel, Audi, Chrysler, Google, among others. And, he, and finally, my favorite, he's a two-time Jeopardy champion and the only human to go undefeated against IBM's Watson. Yeah, I think that is oh, truly McAfee truly. says it can be done, people. We can fight <laughs> against the machines. <laughs> I have done it. That is really great. Yes. <laughs> finally, uh, we have Ms. Ms. Saskia Sassen. Uh, she is the Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology and co-chair. I co didn't win against anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> we still have time. Oh, yeah, right. And co-chair of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. Uh, her research and writing focuses on globalization, immigration, global cities, and new technologies, among many, many topics. Uh, she is the author of The Global City, one of the foremost books describing the inordinate economic and politi political influence of cities. Uh, and she has an upcoming book, I understand, on expulsions when complexity produces elementary brutalities. Uh, she has been chosen as one of the top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine, and recently was named the 2013 winner of the Principe de Astorius Prize for the Social Sciences. So with that, I'd like to welcome our panel and, and kick off our discussion. And I thought maybe we'd start uh, with sort of an open-ended question uh, that we'd give each of our panels a chance to expound a little bit upon. So we are living in the age of cities uh, with unparalleled potential to solve our most significant global challenges, slums and poverty, climate change, resource scarcity, terrorism, and insecurity. How will cities lead the way forward? What models and governance structures can we expect should we look to? I'll leave it. Does anyone have a, a first thought? 
Oh, I thought that we had, there was an we can, order. We can start, why don't we start with uh, Dr. with Tim and, uh, okay. and make our way. Well, it's a good question and a uh, ple pleasure to be here with you guys and uh, with all of you. Let me, let me just start uh, this way. Uh, we've all heard about the planet being urban now since 2004, um, but what we don't hear enough of is that there are more than a thousand cities on the planet now that have a population of half a million or more. And a th those cities, a third of those cities are larger than a third of the countries in the UN. And these places have heft, they have budget, they have smart people, uh, and they are the ones who are facing all the global challenges. It's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, they're also the places uh, that know, because of globalization, and Susk has written about this a lot, and liberalization of trade, national barriers are receding in terms of trade, uh, and exposing cities to more competition. And you talk to any mayor these days, they take this for given, as a given. They understand that the, they have to pull up their socks just to hold position. And so, because they have short terms of office, uh, and a million problems to solve. They're up to here with problems, morning, night, and noon. They know that as a risk strategy, they can't spend a lot of time inventing new solutions at home. So, at least not all of them. So, one of the items of their risk strategy is to go out and find another solution that's been already invented in some other place. And so, that one of the things that uh, I looked at over the past few years that came out in the book, Beyond Smart Cities, is this exchange between among mayors around the world, this horizontal exchange. So let me just explain just briefly what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about ribbon cutting and political exercises where one mayor goes to another and shakes hands and, and does some sort of a cultural deal. I'm talking about technical missions consisting of up to 100 business and civic leaders, sometimes more. Uh, sometimes it's only 20 people. But the idea is that cities go to another place they know what they're after. They've identified a need in advance. They understand what their problem is. They've picked a city that has a solution to that problem, and they go and visit it. They go and visit that city, and they take their stakeholders with them. And so in the process of the visit, they're exchanging ideas and processing what they're seeing so that they're actually creating an environment in which they're able to understand how we're going to adapt this thing that we're seeing back home. Okay, That's what I mean about a technical visit. Uh, city to city visit. I sampled 53 cities from around the world, which has almost a perfect bell-shaped curve in terms of population size. If those 53 cities are at all representative of all the cities on the planet, their size, then there's somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 visits between and among cities every year. So there's this huge underground economy of knowledge exchange going on. And one of the things that this does is that it helps cities be innovative at home because of that processing I was talking about. Because they form clouds of trust, which is a concept I think about. It's basically a network of confidence within the city. Okay? And that cloud of trust enables them to have confidence that the thing that they are going to uh, try to adapt, that technology or that process, could be for parking meters, fire hydrants, how you do public-private participation, what about energy utilities, how you do the water supply, how do you do solid waste collection, you name it, how you do resilience and climate change and immigration and all of the issues that cities have to face, they have to adapt back home. And in that, in that adaptation process, they have to have a confidence in this cloud of trust that they are understanding what they're saying to each other and are able to feel confident that they can move ahead and not get stabbed in the back by somebody else. So, so that's part one yeah. okay, of how ideas exchange. Part two is, and I'll, I'll quiet down in just a second, is that this process of exchange, think about the numbers again, you know, 1,000 to 10,000 visits, it could be more, leads to uh, an association between the cities all around the globe. They are beginning to have more, they're discovering that they have more in common with each other than with the cities in back in their own neighborhood. Okay? And so when you look at the institutions and organizations that have been formed, membership organizations like Don Boards, National League of Cities, like the United Cities and Local Government in Barcelona, like CityNet in, in Seoul, um, Flackman in, in Latin America, you begin to see that they have agglomerated, they're like constellations out there in the cosmos, and they're sort of agglomerating together. 
Okay, they're, they're, they're beginning to associate together. They're forming mega associations across continents. And that association is, rests on the premise that they have strength in numbers and that they're able to influence policy in, uh, whether it might be in, in international trade or immigration or climate change or any of the global uh, goods issues that everybody talks about. So I think that that's the direction we're going in the answer to the global governance thing. It's not a parliament of mayors. I think that's a mm. bridge way too far. An idea that has been put out by others uh, <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the urban space. Yes. Um, but, but there is this association, uh, and this tissue is growing. So I'll stop there. I like the, there. the idea of, of the underground economy and knowledge. I think that's a very interesting way to describe it. Greg, your thoughts on uh, where yeah, we're going. I mean, building off of some of that a bit, I mean, I'm particularly interested in the phenomenon that I like to refer to as the instant city, which is really the notion, which we've talked about technology, of course, this entire conference, and, and, you know, the notion of smart cities has already been invoked, the notion of building technology into cities. I'm particularly interested in the city itself as a technology, uh, where urbanism is almost sort of a, is a coincidental afterthought, um, not that it's a particularly good thing. <laughs> um, but this is places like, so for example, this is like Songdo, South Korea, sort of one of the archetypal smart cities, uh, aerotropolises, I've written about it at length. Um, you know, it, it gets a lot of press for the notion that Cisco's going to go in there and make it, you know, a pneumatic trash tube collection, all that sort of stuff. But the thing to remember about Songdo is, you know, 15 years ago in the wake of the Asian financial crisis where the IMF and the Washington consensus told Korea, you have to open yourself to international conglomerates and open yourself up to foreign actors. The Koreans sat down and said, okay, we're going to build a city. That was their response to it. They created the Incheon Free Economic Zone, so they created a special zone with special economic powers, designated English as the official language of IFES, and then because they wanted to build a city that would be attractive to multinationals and their expatriate workers, hired an American developer, Gale International, with their New York-based architect team from Cohn, Peterson, Fox, and set out to design a, basically a ghostly sort of clone of Manhattan and, and other cities you know and love, where the streets are brought to Manhattan, there's pocket parks from Savannah, there's architectural features reminiscent of Sydney and Venice and others. Um, it doesn't look like Vegas, it just sort of, you know, you get this tickling in the back of your mind being like, I've been here before. Um, and, but, you know, but the solution was to build a city, and, and, you know, and it struggled a bit because, you know, the other sort of extrajudicial stuff, extra-legal stuff they were counting on, like the U.S.-South Korea Free Trade Agreement, Agreement, you know, was held up for years in Congress, and so they've struggled. They've, they've attracted a number of, of Korean families, but not the corporations they hope to do. And then we've seen other cases, sort of an example of a formalization of, of what Dr. Campbell was talking about was, you know, um, in China you have uh, Sino-Singapore Tianjin Eco City and Sino-Singapore Guangzhou Knowledge City. Um, these are basically collaborations between the Chinese state-owned enterprises and Singapore's holdings through Temasek. Uh, and the goal is to basically pass best practices from Singapore into China. We, basically, the, the premise is, we want you to teach us to be more like Singapore. And their object of expression is to build two cities, one of which is, of course, intended to be China's Silicon Valley, because this is also what you see around the world increasingly. We want, to, we want our own Silicon Valley. We want our own sort of technology industry. What you do is you go build a city, whether you are China, whether you are Ecuador, which is building one like that, whether whether you are Korea, that was meant to be Songdo's fate as well. Um, and so you see you know, sort of this object of, uh, of expression. And then you know, the sort of part of that, which I'm really interested too, is, you know, is you're seeing um, you know, places like Dubai, for example, the Dubai International Finance Center. I mean, if you choose to situate there, you're not only choosing Class A office space in Dubai as a company, um, your court of highest court of appeal is the British High Court. Um, you know, basically, the DIFC has opted into a completely different legal system uh, in the middle of a city in the middle of an emirate. Um, and so you know, while I don't, I'm not certain how many more city-states we're going to see. I, I think it'd be interesting if, if in the century we start seeing more breakaway independent cities. But we are starting to sort of see this sort of, you know, pick and choose from column A, B, and C uh, what legal structures you want to belong to, what potential immigrations you want to do with Boris Johnson calling for regional-based visas in London. And we've seen the, go you know, the governor of Michigan has called for urban pioneer visas in Detroit. You know, the notion that we could see cities have their own visa regimes like Canadian provinces do now. Um, so, you know, we're seeing these interesting agglomerations. It's yet to sort of, you know, coalesce into this. And I have to agree that, you know, it's, it's tough to see a parliament of mayors, but you know, I'm starting to wonder whether we'll see you know some sort of you know relationships between the two, where you know you get you know perhaps you get a, a visa to three different cities at once that have agreed to ally like that, or you know, or you end up with sort of your choice of legal structures based on where you choose to situate in a city. Um, so that's I'll let Saskia take it from there. That, 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 that's great, and I, the ironic thing about Silicon Valley as a model is it's not really a city in the traditional sense anyway. Uh, so it's a sort of an so imagined in, idea. And we can get into this question, but you know, the urbanism of these places is yeah. tangential at best to its actual founding statements, which is what makes all of these instant cities very problematic. Right, right. right. So well, you, I thought, just picking up on your question and certainly building up on these two, I, I think that what we are living through, this particular period, uh, contains within it, when it comes to cities, governance, etc., 
uh, several layers of informal governance. And some of them relate, connect the city, if you want, to the national space. But the other ones are global. And I'm particularly interested in the second ones. So if we stay, start with the, with the national, there has really been a kind of funny and really informal downscaling whereby national policy, in our case made in Washington, etc., winds up de facto, as opposed to formally, being urban policy. Not presented as urban policy, but that's where it gets enacted. So a lot of economic policies, actually, not all, eh? I'm saying a lot, wind up being urban policies. This is the story of the last 20 years, I would say, in this country. And in other countries, it plays out differently. But internationally, partly on the informal exchanges of knowledge, and this is really like learning from each other, partly, second element, very important, uh, a kind of urbanizing of non-economic sectors. So if you're a mine, if you're a plantation, you know, a firm that is a plantation, you will have a stronger urban moment in the trajectory that your operations entail because you need very specialized lawyering, very special accountants, very specialized financial, etc., and counsel, and you're going to get them in a city. So your mine operation may be there, your headquarters might be in some small city, but you need access to this, what I have described as this global city function, which is really an intermediate sector, which is also the growth sector in all our advanced economies, if you look at the, also for the United States, by the way. Eh? That is where the highest growth rates are happening. It doesn't account for most of the economy, but it is where the high growth rates are. So that the, a lot of what is non-urban now has an <coughs> urban moment. So that then also brings, and especially when the actors are global, it means that there is a kind of, again, informal global geopolitics. Now, as a, as a, as a little bit of a footnote, eh, not because I'd want to not to go there, but if you think of asymmetric war, that is also an urbanizing of war. In other words, when the United States goes to war, it's not going to go to war against France or China or Japan. Its enemy is going to be what we kindly call irregular combatants. Mm -hmm. Well, for the irregular combatant who does not deploy tanks and air forces, the city it's the technology for making war. So what we have right now, and we have seen that over the last 15 years very clearly, that the theater of war is not just the country, Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever. It is also a series of cities that can include cities that have nothing to do, like the bombings in Madrid, let's say, right? The bombings in London, for that matter. So, so. Um, what, what, you, what you have then is even an urbanizing just to, of that extreme condition, which really is the, the domain of the national state. Now, coming back to sort of that intermediate zone of a global geopolitics, and it is informal, but when we did de deregulation, privatization, all of those measures that were critical to develop this global economic system we have today. You know, for other global economic systems, you may not have needed that, but you need that for the kind of system that we have. All of that, again, means that what used to be the domain of the national state, tariffs on imports, etc., you know, the whole variety of things that where the state played a very active role and the authorizing role to have those international transactions, they have now been scaled down <coughs> informally in a way. It's not an expli explicit thing. It's you deregulate, you, you, you privatize, that's national state policy. But it plays out at a non-national level and very importantly, clearly, at an urban level, like New York City, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, you know, a few places that really dominate. So out of that, you can then stand back and say, what we're really dealing with is a kind of emergent geo-urban geopolitics. It does not cover everything, but it covers a lot of what was not in it 30 years ago. So in that sense, 
this, what you're describing very well, is just part of the story and what you were describing too, you know. So more and more, but I'm particularly interested in this notion that part of what we used to call international relations is now formal international relations, formal international law, etc., is now actually an emergent condition that has not yet been formalized. So on the, on the horizon, I see the work of making the rules, making the laws, making a new type of treaty law. Remember treaty law, which is our main form of international law, that runs through national states. So this, to me then, is this very peculiar moment when a lot of informality inhabits what is basically an extremely formal space. Right? And so, et cetera, you, you can see where I'm going. No, I'm absolutely. Going to in fact, too. I want to I <laughs> press that point a little bit and, and welcome responses from all three of you in the sense that even if the trend lines look more and more like cities are taking on some of the functions that formerly national governments uh, have undertaken uh, in the past, uh, there also, I think, is a, is a prevailing issue that city governments are oftentimes weak, that you have overlapping governance structures that prevent any one person from exercising authority in an appropriate way. I'm struck by a, a, a trip I took a few years back to Mumbai, just seeing that no one really has full control over any that single nobody aspect. could control Mumbai. Right. There are cities well, that cannot be Maybe it's an outlier, but yes. I guess the, the <laughs> question is, thinking about governance in cities themselves, what sort of things will have to happen so that a, as, as power devolves increasingly from the national level to cities, cities themselves have the capacity uh, in the governance structures to take on those challenges, whether it's climate change, whether it's resource scarcity, whether it's something else like that. Can, can I, I just, I know that it, we should go in neat order. I just want to clarify, when I said urbanize, I did not mean simply urban government. It's, you know, the financial sector, I mean, if only the New York City government could regulate and fully control. No, it doesn't. So, so I was talking about the city becomes the zone, but it can mean corporations, it can mean, you know, all kinds of other actors, not just city government. Just to clarify, so as yeah, not to confuse absolutely. you. Yes. Right. I mean, I think the whole idea, I think that you're, that you're underscoring here is that in your, one of your earlier books about authority, territory, and yes. rights, uh, is essentially what you're talking about here, uh, is now on an informal basis. Yeah. And no, I mean, right. let's just reflect for a minute on what we mean by governance, okay? So at one point, 50 years ago, you know, the British tradition, we used to think of governance was an authority to do certain things, to implement and carry out laws, that there's no entropy in the system, that it gets done, okay? We lost that a long time ago, and certainly it was never possible in most of the global south. <clears throat> so. When we, talk, when we think about governance, then we're thinking about, we do have these formal apparatus of, of, of uh, representative government in many places. Mumbai, let's take that example, or Cape Town, or uh, wherever. Um, but they don't do everything that we ex expect or want them to do anyway. This is what you're saying. Right. And so I think that the, the edge that we're establishing here is that this is an informal system, top to bottom in some ways. And, and I think yeah, one, of the things that I, one of the things right. that I see in these cities are learning from each other is that they're, it's the, like the Brazilian term, jeitinho. Now you're figuring out a way to get around it. You're figuring out a way to solve a problem, even if it's not the formal way, even if it's not the legal way. And um, that's what I see also in these associations of uh, mayors and associations of local governments in nations. You know, they are agglomerating in a way that is to say they're joining forces. They have some informal and formal arrangements where they agree to talk to each other and agree to take common positions on certain things like climate change in Warsaw last week or the week before. And that they're having influence in a way that they didn't have before. And that is the uh, tantamount to governance, oh, I think. That's really interesting. Greg, where does informality meet formality? When well, it comes I was going to say, there's, I mean, there's a couple ways to talk about this. So, I mean, in, you know, Suske used informal in one regard. I'm really interested also, as, as well as all of us are, in sort of informality in the sense of slums, since you mentioned, you know, we're going to see a doubling of slums. I mean, you know, there's one of my favorite stats is, uh, you know, Sully Angel at NYU, that urban land cover is going to double in 19 years and is going to triple, uh, uh, you know, in 40 years, which basically, you know, every square <laughs> centimeter of, of land over, uh, under us is going to triple, and the vast majority of that will be in formal settlements will be unplanned yeah. slums. Yeah. So that's really the condition we're grappling with, which is you know very bad and very 
optimistic in some regards at the same time. But I, you know, what, what we are going to see is we're going to see stuff like, you know, I think the, I think Rio's favelas and the notion of, you know, we have sort of governance as being run by gangs and re, being run by communities that are essentially sort of decoupled uh, from, you know, the municipalities which technically govern them. Um, I think is one regard of that. And I was thinking, you know, another the response, the, the really dystopian response to Mumbai uh, is Lavasa, which is a city being built from scratch uh, to the southeast of it. Um, Lavasa is it was designed to be a, a Tuscan hill town, uh, you know, on a, on, on a reservoir that was created. And, um, you know, it's essentially being built by the Hindustan Construction Company and is designed to be spun out as a private corporation. Um, so we're seeing, you know, the, the notion of the city as a publicly traded company uh, and as sort of a wealth catcher. And, uh, and they're not alone. Renaissance Capital out of Moscow is, you know, has more than a, a contracts to build more than a dozen cities across Africa, including a new CBD for Nairobi. It's a direct response to the ungovernability of Nairobi. We're going to build a shining, pristine free zone on the north north of the city where we can basically keep them out. Um, and then, you know, another example of that is, you know, uh, is you know, just as an aside, is King Abdullah Economic City in Saudi Arabia, where I was at. If you've read Dave Eggers' Hologram for the King, this is the setting for that. And that that is yet another privately developed corporation by Imar, a you know, subsidiary of the Dubai-based construction company, um, where that is sort of being built. Uh, you know, is essentially as a place to put the millions of Saudis, underemployed Saudis, uh, who they're trying to desperately create jobs for, which is why they're you know, uh, you know, deporting two million Ethiopians right now to the country. Um, so that's another private corporation. And it's designed, this city is designed to attract foreign direct investment flows and create a diversified economy that the Saudis themselves have not been able to do. So they're essentially looking to the market to provide the governance and the creation of jobs and services that the Saudis themselves cannot seem to do, at least in the, in the form that they want to do. Um, so that's one whole angle. And then, yeah, coming back to that is, I think, you know, I I think when we discuss sort of uh, you know regulation and governance, uh, I'm particularly interested in what, you know what can we learn from informality in places like you know in Dharavi and Mumbai and Kibera and Nairobi, um, where you know if we basically have uh, top-down you know governance apparatuses that simply cannot keep up with the urban explosion. You know what can we learn in terms of regulation from them? You know do we need to be have a loosening uh, of the regulations of, that are this basically crippling places like Detroit, which has 78,000 abandoned homes, most of which are in foreclosure. They can't clear them out of the courts. Uh, the rest has tax liens on it, and so you have an urban fabric that is not only in total disrepair, but it's frozen from a legal perspective. How do we reactivate that? How do we occupy it? Um, and you know, basically sort of try to rehab it. So I think there's some sort of notion of semi-formal governance that, that sort of ties into this as well. We need to, you know, instead of just the informal and the formal, you know, is there an interface layer between the two? I think that's one of the projects that we should be looking at. Yeah. Yes, because a lot of what I was talking about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the role of corporations, et cetera, of lawyering, these are all formal instrumentalities, but they are not formally designed to have the governance functions that we have associated with national states. So it's a very interesting kind. It's not informal in the sense of irregular. You know, it's just that there is a missing layer. Now, I am one of those, and most of my friends disagree with me, but I say, just thinking now of the United States, since we're in the United States, this is a time to make new law. You know, laws are made. They don't just fall from the sky. We have to get rid of a lot of old laws, and we need to make some new laws. Now, this, I, I think of that, that these are all kinds of issues, but this intermediate layer where more and more of what we might call the governing of a geopolitical space, especially economic, but not exclusively, huh? Uh, that we need new law. Now, if it's international, it will be treaty law, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I think that this is actually an interesting period. And as a footnote, I don't know if we want to return to this or not. I, I was just doing this interview on NPR, you know, where it's, okay, where are we at with cities now, with global cities? And I found myself saying, sometimes an interview really makes me think, you know, when I'm alone, I'm more lazy about thinking. I don't know about you, but you know, an interview is like, yeah, let me think about it. So anyhow, I think that the period that starts 30 years ago, you know, this globalizing period where cities are built up, you know, we have all seen it, you know, whole new built environments, right? State of the art environments, partial uh, gentrification and expulsion, but still all these new. But I think that right now we have done that project. When you look at our economies, all our economies, are shrinking. No matter that we are capturing growth, but we are smaller economies in terms of several variables, indicators, than we were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And so it seems to me that it's kind of stasis. Yes, we are sputtering a bit of growth there, and China is still growing at 10%, but that's in relative terms of decline. You know? but, and so I ask myself, when I think about 
what is the strategic role or the strategic events of today's epoch that get captured in the space of the city. So thinking of the city as a heuristic space, a space that tells you something about a larger story than itself. Huh? Seeing that the cities that you described do that too. It's not just song, huh? it tells you a larger story. I think it's a social question. Mm. Now the social question is wobbly, messy. It does not lend itself to strict regulation, otherwise you you kill it. So it's a very ambiguous talk about it in between, between formal and informal. It's not informal either though, right? And so it seems to me that one of the challenges is to generate a kind of regulatory thinking or norms, I don't mean regulations, that's far too confining, but about a whole variety of issues, of course, that are captured in the language of growing social inequality, etc. And cities are a vanguard space because cities are making a lot of this stuff visible. The Occupy movements, this, this generation <coughs> of women and men, the sons and daughters of the middle classes who, and not just in the United States, in many countries around the world, are not going to achieve what their parents achieved. You know, this sort of progressive, doing a bit better. It's not going to happen. So this is a very peculiar time. That's a totally different variable I'm bringing into the picture. But also this, because it's so acute and so visible in cities, um, I think that this is going to in make, produce an invitation to generate a kind of, again, a global geopolitical line of thinking that deals with a social question. We see it in things that have to do with health and epidemics. Yeah. We realize we've got to get certain epidemics under control or they're going to spread to the rich world. We, cannot, we see it with quality of air. Look at Shanghai. Have any of you seen the reason? I mean, it's incredible. So there are yeah, certain... East Coast, and the East Coast governors suing the EPA to get the Midwestern states to stop polluting their air? Yes. I mean, there were, at one point, there were 16 governors who sued the US EPA, you know, to raise its standard. Oh, anyhow, that. so there's a bundle of issues that we have thought of as falling completely outside yeah. international geopolitics which are creeping into it. Now we handle them not in, in, in the usual you know, international relations framing, we're handling them through very private, like, like the Thank You Gates Foundation for this and that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, many private systems. But this is becoming a very <coughs> crowded and potentially contradictory zone. More the informal, the, zone the way of, Tim has described it in some respects. Well, informal, in, each, each intervention is actually pretty formal. Yeah, I have to stop talking. You know, he looked at his clock like that, so he was really telling me. I'm just stopping. To... No, no, absolutely. You're absolutely right. No, I appreciate that. Do I look offended? No. No, I'd love to involve the audience. I wanna, I, I'm sure we have so much fodder for discussion. Uh, uh, I'll start taking questions, uh, and just please state your name and affiliation uh, when we start over here uh, in the front, and we'll make our way around. Hi, Esben Barteide from Norway. Fascinating panel. Um, I, it struck me that what you're describing is, has some resemblance to the city-states prior to the nation-state. I mean, for the roughly 1,000 years after the Roman Empire, before the modern nation-state, what, what Europe was, was uh, you know, a number of city-states which had their own legal system. There were some kind of diffuse Catholic authority on the, normal, uh, the normative side, but basically there were cities running the place. And then the nation-state comes in and tried to m marry, in a sense, the, the cities and the countryside, but fencing off to other nation states and, and defining sovereignty. And, 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 and it's a very fascinating story that you're all telling, which I think is you know, a, a perfectly correct observation of where we're going. But since one of our themes yesterday was growing inequalities, I mean, there's, you have touched on inequalities in cities, but how do we keep up the polity, which is very much the imagined community, as Benedict Anderson said, between the city, the urban, and the rural? Uh, you know, what, what happens to politics and the sense of cohesion and the sense of collective decision making if cities simply start ignoring the uh, surrounding landscape and, and just, you know, link up to other cities? I mean, I, I see some political challenges in that. As, um, That's a, it's a great question. And we see that playing out in the U.S. Senate uh, every, every single day, the sort of dichotomy between the rural and the urban and, and the politics. Uh, Greg, maybe, do you have a, a thought? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I blanked there for a second. Um, 
That's an inequality. I'm, well, I'm, I don't know about the sort of notion of the, of the urban rural hinterland sort of inequality there. I am particularly interested in sort of the notion there's, you know, Mike Davis wrote a hair raising book in 2006 called Planet of Slums, where, which ties back into the first panel today, Andrew McAfee's group discussing, you know, um, you know, job creation and automation killing jobs. I mean, this was one of Davis's points that, you know, that basically this sort of urban, this, this human tidal wave of urbanization is going to fail disastrously because we can no longer create the, you know, the mass amount of jobs necessary through industrialization. Um, which you know is still an open question, um, but I'm I'm interested in it because you know I've been following stuff like you know like the maker movement, distributed manufacturing, 3D printing, all the stuff that's supposed to lead to a U.S. manufacturing renaissance. When you look at the actual sort of uh, uh, implementation of that in cities, you know when you look at maker communities, or whatever else, it's informal manufacturing. I mean this is essentially what's going on in Indian slums as it is, um, and so I'm particularly interested when I hang out with architects and whatnot who are imagining sort of reimagining American suburbia, for example, on the you know not quite rural, but imagining that where they're imagining sort of you know informal service is popping up in suburbs to sort of you know uh, uh, aid the residents that you know the, the stuff that sort of we take for granted in dense central cities but is missing in suburbia it again it mirrors the economics of sort of informal settlements and so I I don't know I'm, I'm particularly interested and also a bit alarmed by the fact that you know that we're that you know what we imagine sort of urban services I guess the United States uh, and perhaps possibly Western Europe as well uh, is sort of trending back towards this informal and you sort of see the sort of breakdown of service delivery um, and breakdown of urban finance being able to afford it and you're starting to see people take matters into their own hands uh, or at least that's suggested. Um, so that's that's sort of alarming to me in the sense of inequality there. Where you know I, I, I you know whenever I read you know urban triumphalists like Ed Glazer and Richard Florida and yay we won cities are back. It's like great. So we basically pushed all the poor people into <laughs> right. the suburbs into the housing stock yeah. that cannot support them that will collapse and now we're going to starve them in suburbs, which seems to be the sort of de facto urban policy of people like Mike Bloomberg, you know, from whom the number of, of homeless doubled on his watch uh, when we became the world's preeminent global city. So it's that you know and this is I mean Saskia. I know this from reading Saskia stuff about the fractal inequality of global cities this way, and it strikes me as that, that the fractals are getting you know further and further clearly defined that way. Yeah, it's sort of reverse migration. Tim or Saskia? Well, let me just uh, jump in a little bit on this. I, guess I think there's one thing here about the poverty and inequality that, <clears throat> that um, jumps over another aspect that hasn't been covered, which is the response to citizens mm -hmm. to this globalization business and to what cities are doing and how cities are talking to each other and that sort of thing. And I think that the that uh, on, on the poverty side, I, mean, I remember going to Rio slums in the 70s and seeing one story, uh, stucco uh, and wood framed housing uh, with muddy uh, walkways and no drainage and no indoor plumbing. And 25 years later, going back to the same spot and uh -huh. seeing three stories, yeah, yeah. completely stuccoed, really, internal, yeah. internal plumbing, uh, paved sidewalks and so on. So, and that taught me, I said, well, of course, I mean, everything we ever learned about housing is, you know, particularly housing for the poor. It takes much longer, but it's basically the same process. You know, you don't get paid, you don't sort of borrow in advance and get a mortgage to do it. You do it as you can do it. And that was a citizen response to an inability of the city to control land and land prices and to supply housing. And I think that the analog to that in, in the modern times uh, takes many forms, but there are lots of uh, citizen engagement, some legal and some illegal, some uh, uh, very visible and others not, where citizens are taking into their own hands uh, the abilities to respond and to make demands on local governments. So, um, for instance, uh, some of the work I've been doing recently suggests that uh, the marriage of the youth bulge and the mobile miracle uh, is having a, st a strong impact on local governments. Youth bulge means, you know, if you look at the demographic profile in the global north, it's, a, it's a, an erect cylinder, okay? Equal numbers of people in each age category. That's the only other direction is kind of going this way, yeah. Yeah, like right, Japan or maybe, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, some of us turned 70 this week, okay? So we're, uh, but, but in the global south, it's looking like this. There are a billion people between 15 and 24. And, and that's the youth bulge. On the mobile miracle, Somebody mentioned today there are a couple of billion cell phones on the planet. There are seven, almost seven billion cell phones now on the planet. Almost saturation. Okay, so and it's not whether or not people have access to the cell phones. It's what are they doing with them? Okay, and that that's the question these days. And if you look at that 15 to 24 year old, you're seeing those people have 2G dumb phones, you know, feature phones. They don't have access to the internet, but they're using them in SMS ways, just sending messages to one another to mobilize politically, to clarify their identities, 
to uh, draw boundaries around their community, to, to pressure local governments for where's our sidewalks, where's those jobs, where's that drainage we talked about. And of course, that's not all they're doing with the cell phones. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a small sliver of what they're doing with their cell phones. But it is a, it's an example of citizen response with new technologies. And I think that this is something else that we need to talk about in terms of the equality issue, the rural urban issue. I mean, for me, it's all urban now. I don't, I, you know, for me, it's not so much the rural urban anymore. It's, it's urban, what's happening in the, in the cities. And so, well, on the one hand, we have this mixed metaphor of governance and informality with, and I think you very rightly point out, Saskia, there's still, because the world is, is urban, you know, all of the sectors and all of the uh, professions and the legal systems hit the ground in an urban place. That's where, that's because it's an urban world. So that's what's going to happen. But what's the response to that? And I think that we need to look much more carefully. Yeah. So I want to answer your question. We need entities like the modern national state. We cannot, otherwise, you know, it becomes a multiplicity of horizontal systems that connect globally and then we have a mess. And mind you, in the European Union, we're beginning to see this problem. For instance, there are too many human rights regimes, you know, institutionally speaking, et cetera, within Europe. So there is now sort of, com there, there are conflicts. It's extremely interesting when you watch that international zone, you know. But so what I think what we need to do is the modern national state, on the one hand, I think of as an extremely accomplished capability because it has to negotiate multiple logics. It is far more a working liberal state, and I would argue also a working communist state, unlike Russia today. But, you know, uh, earlier work where they were, you know, they were okay. Uh, they have to negotiate multiple logics, whereas a multinational corporation, no matter how rich, one logic. So we cannot throw out this production that we made collectively out of so many wars, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to reoccupy <laughs> yeah. or inhabit this national state, you know, make it the site for different aspirations, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so it doesn't mean either throwing out all the law that we have, but it means making a lot of new law. It means rethinking a lot of treaty law. It means, you know, there is real, I really see there is work to be done. So I totally, uh, I don't know where you were coming from exactly, but I would say, yes, we cannot. It's just interesting that you have a de facto downscaling to that city level for some very compelling reasons. And that's good too, because cities can be more democratic in a way. Huh? Great. In the back. Shall we collect questions because we're running out of time, I think? Sure, we can uh, collect maybe a couple after, after we go with, with Peter. Yes, hello, I'm Peter Engelke. I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council and the Strategic Foresight Initiative. Um, I just am curious as to, I apologize, I missed the first five to 10 minutes of the panel. I was outside uh, engaging in another conversation, so perhaps I missed some discussion of this question, but I'm just curious as to panelists' thoughts on the, on the, on, uh, about the issues raised at the last panel. Uh, food, water, energy issues, uh, natural resource issues, uh, ecological issues at global scale that are the consequence of basically what we're witnessing right now. Um, I've made the argument before that cities can be both a solution to the problems that we discussed in the last uh, panel, uh, but they can, they're also clearly going to be a problem unless we do something differently about how we build. No, great question. Why don't we uh, answer that, and then we'll start bundling questions after. But let's make very short answers. Short answers, short, crisp answers. <laughs> so can I start? Please. So I think that cities have to be solutions. I'm just going to that one part. Huh? But uh, because, because they are the source of so much destruction. But what we're doing right now in terms of that aspiration, the policy level we're dealing with, is a disaster. Now, I think cities are doing much better than national governments. You know, I was at Rio 20, Rio Plus 20, and the, the, there was a summit of mayors. They knew how to talk to each other, exchange information, etc. Very, very good on that environmental vector. National governments arrive and they regress to carbon trading, which is basically the right for more pollution, either to do it or to sell it to somebody who wants to do it. So it redistributes 
you know, but it doesn't change anything. So, for instance, what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at biologists. I'm interested in biology and the kind of technologies that you look at. So just to mention an example, and I think everybody should know this because it captures something very important. Uh, so some, some biology, most biologists are not interested in the environment. They are just average scientists. You know, they're interested in <laughs> whatever they are. But those who are, and they're a growing number, are doing fantastic stuff. So they discovered a... a, a a bacterium that if put in brown waters, in other words, what we produce in vast quantities in kitchens and bathrooms, etc., uh, and which is a real problem of disposal, which also is environmentally unsustainable, <laughs> actually produces a molecule of a plastic that is durable and resistant, but biodegradable. That means recoding something that we cities produce in mass, which is now a problem from a negative to a positive, and we can either export the plastic, uh, the biodegradable plastic, or we can you know, export the whatever, the brown waters. But that is just an example. And so every surface, every surface should be working. It should be gathering energy, it should be gathering uh, solar, it should be bacteria that purify the air, etc. Then the city is actually recoded and becomes a positive. We're always going to be a bit destructive, no way around that. Huh? But that is sort of one thinking that I have. Uh, a technological solution needs to serve us. Well, I was going to say, yeah. I want to do the flip side of that technology. So I apologize because I did not attend the entire previous session because I was prepping for this. But I did hear, you know, there was one point there was a discussion of first we're going to have smart grids and that's going to be awesome. And then we're going to have smart cities and that's going to be even more awesome. And then we're going to have the Internet of Things and we're going to have total awesomeness <laughs> for dealing with sustainability issues. And we're going to have a much smarter planet. I wasn't there. I, you know, it's a bit of exaggeration. But, but, this is the sort of, but this is the sort of language that I have studied very closely in talking to the IBMs and the Cisco's. And apologies if you're in the room. But I, I just found it interesting that, you know, that there is an unspoken assumption here about doing smart cities and technology in cities towards the aim of sustainability, that if we just wire them all up, we'll get 10% efficiencies and everything's going to turn out great for, for society. And, and you know, it drives me crazy because these are completely unexamined assumptions about how those technologies enter the debate here. And when we talk about smart cities, which hasn't come up, but I want to address it real fast, is you know, all of those companies were basically hawking similar technologies for years in the forms of smart homes and entertainment solutions. And consumers rightly said, I don't need an internet connected fridge. Why are you trying to sell this to me? Um, but with 2008 and the financial crisis, you know, IBM and the others smartly went back and said, you know what, we can sell this to governments, and if we use sustainability as our selling word, we can sell this to them. And so they went back and they raided the cupboards for whatever technology they had lying around, trying to sell in the form of smart grids and everything else, and to which they've had very, very mixed results. Um, you know, pilots don't go anywhere, and apparently lower than the expected sales projections, according to The Economist. So I just want to say that, you know, that when we get into this about how can we address this in cities, um, you know, my thumbnail answer is I think cities will make the world worse from a carbon, carbon emission standpoint and then make it better eventually uh, you know, once you achieve a higher standard of living. But you know, the notion that we can deploy technologies willy-nilly and do this, uh, you know, the answer is yes in some cases, but you have to understand the assumptions of that because that has effects for governance too. One minor point here is you know, the, the one, one of the great smart city examples that IBM touts is Rio de Janeiro where Eduardo Paez has created a, a central control center for administering the government. And in doing so, he basically brought 30 or 40 agencies under one roof, quite literally, in his sort of NASA meets James Bond villain layer, um, and you know, and essentially changed the urban governance model. He created a very strong executive branch because he was able to use technology to re-architect how the city was observed and partially governed and moved it in there. There was no elections, no referendums, no nothing on this. And I'm not even saying it's a bad thing, but I thought that was interesting where urban governance and governance in general was changed because IBM built the system and then, and then Payos was able to extend it in various ways. Found example of the intersection of technology uh, and, and authority. Why don't we take a bundle a couple questions uh, from the crowd for, uh, for the panel in the front. My name is Walter Jurassic. Uh, the question to you and comment, short comment. <laughs> Built in cities very easy. To maintain it is very difficult. <laughs> from transportation to water, that's where the money comes from. What you can tell to the world into the US city what they can learn from city like Detroit, which once was very prosperous, mm -hmm. and what happened now? So what they can learn from it? Right. Great so question. Let's, we're collecting questions, yeah. right? Uh, another, another question over there. Uh. 
Yeah, my, my question is uh, between top-down and bottom-up uh, city growth and design. It seems as though uh, right now we see a lot of chaotic bottom-up growth that makes it very hard to create systems, whereas the top-down involves relocating large numbers of people. What's the trend and how does the city keep up with the rate of population? Great. And I have one more question uh, from Twitter. Uh, actually as well for your consideration. Uh, John Hanasek asks, on the theme of individual empowerment, can cities provide a framework for converting consensus opinion into action? So, so three, three questions. One on building cities is easy, sustainable, uh, sustainability is difficult, uh, bottom, in, uh, bottom up uh, development and how that makes it difficult to create systems and then uh, the theme of individual empowerment. Okay. Uh, I'll open it up. Maybe Tim, you didn't speak the last round. Well, uh, yeah, that's quite a collection. Um, on the what cities can learn from Detroit, I mean, <clears throat> I would turn the question around. I think the, the, a lot of cities in the global uh, north can learn something from the global south about how space is used in cities. And, and Curitiba and Bogota are two great examples of that. Um, and by that, I mean that they have changed the transport systems, which, which I think are a key to a lot of the food, water, and energy thing, as well as to livability in cities in the future yeah. by, by collectivizing transport, basically. Um, let me just leave it at that short answer because there's so much other, other stuff to cover. On, uh, on top down and bottom up, uh, you know, the, the business about um, Solly Angel's data and showing that cities are, basically densities are going down everywhere. That, that's the problem. And it's not only that these are low density slums. In fact, m most of the time slums are higher density, uh, but uh, that uh, the issue with dealing with city immigration and, and uh, building cities is falling into a regional uh, concern. Okay, so it's not so much top down or bottom up. It's what do you do in the middle, in the in the regionals? Because most of this growth is happening outside of the formal city boundaries. So I think that the it, it raises a new issue rather than giving you an answer there. Okay, at least that's how I would cover it. And then on the framework for what was the last question? The framework of. No, this is the individual empowerment, how cities can provide a, fra a framework for converting consensus opinion into action. Yeah, well, I think participation by uh, citizens in cities is one of the bright spots in all of the uh, dialogue that we've been talking yeah. about because there's so, there's so much going on and there's, there's uh, particularly with the advent of the information technology age, there's much more ability to communicate and to be heard. Uh, that's what I see anyway, these young people, for instance, in, uh, in the global south. Uh, using cell phones to, for instance, and, and in many, many other examples. So I think that's a bright spot. And the framework is basically, uh, it's a democratic framework in cities, which is something that has a competitive advantage for cities that doesn't work so much for nations because they're so much further away. Right, right. Let me just leave it there. I'll go. And then you say no, no, you go. You go. All right. All right. So um, I'll just touch upon uh, Detroit and the empowerment one. Um, Detroit. You know, it's interesting. You know, what is a city? I, I think the, the answer, the question about what happened to Detroit, goes back to what is a city. You know, there was the Le Corbusier said, you know, a city is a machine for living. Patrick Geddes argued it was an organism, and sort of the hot new metaphor for it that's coming out of the biology crowd and others, and uh, is that basically cities are stars They're, or suns, if you want to use it. They are giant social fusion reactors where social networks are compressed in space and time, and there is emergent overlap out of it via serendipity, whoever else, and new functions come out of this, new meetings, new companies, new growth. This goes back to the heart of urban economics. Jane Jacobs herself wrote about this in The Economy of Cities, and this is what cities are. And so the failure of Detroit, which she ordained before the Japanese automakers ever showed up, was that Detroit was doomed to fail because it was a monoculture, and that those networks had basically ossified, hardened, and were calcifying. Um, and so you know, I think the problem of what happened to Detroit there was simply you know, the social networks failed, you had white flight, you basically were left with sort of you know, a, a black underclass, and you no longer had sort of networks of individuals and communities who were willing to sort of make it work. And then the urban fabric fell away and you had a sort of self-reinforcing downward spiral, which is why my thought on, you know, one way we should intervene in, in Detroit is basically how do we reactivate public space? How do we reactivate spaces? This goes into transportation. They're finally trying to do the largest city in America, I think with maybe the exception of Tampa, that doesn't have any effective mass transit in it. They're finally trying to get around to doing this along the Woodward Corridor. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I think those are sort of the things of why Detroit fails. We basically need to start reactivating, start re-knitting these social fabrics back 
interact together using public space and shared space. And so this goes back to the empowerment. I'm, I'm really interested in stuff like, you know, I was thinking of that of, um, you know, one way of approaching that or you're seeing is stuff like Brickstarter or, you know, Kickstarter urbanism, crowdfunded urbanism. Um, the notion of, you know, doing very, very small investments and very, very small entities around you, being able to invest in your block or invest in a local entrepreneur in your corner, coming up with financing mechanisms to do this, coming up with mechanisms for shared space. Um, so, you know, just as an aside, right after this, I'm going back to New York for the FT Citigroup uh, Urban Ingenuity Awards. And one of the finalists that I hope to vote for uh, is called Three Space, where they're essentially a UK outfit, one of many, uh, that basically goes to landlords that would rather not rent because it's not worth their time or tax implications or whatever. Uh, and they basically work on behalf of the community to take this sort of space that's locked away and activate it for local entrepreneurs and make it available at sort of micro scale so you can get people into the cities. And so I'm really interested in sort of these sort of citizen, you know, uh, middleware layers of things like that where you're going to have more associations and organizations uh, and using software that can sort of, you know, allow you to sort of participate in the public process as much as you want to because the whole process of doing stuff at, you know, city, you know, at city board meetings and wherever else can be exposed. So you can sort of see the whole process of how I can get this bill passed or how I can get this sort of park implemented. You know, I like to think technology has a role in that of, of me understanding you know, what's been described as the dark matter of urban governance where you simply don't understand what's going on inside of it. Absolutely. Just ask you a quick response. Right. So in terms of a city like Detroit, and mind you, Detroit is not the only one, huh? In Germany, we have the Schrumpfende Städte. This notion of cities dying is real. <laughs> Not maybe in the global south. I don't know. There is like, but it's happening. Now, see, I just wrote a little piece that I'm happy to send to you where I compared Chicago and Detroit. So Chicago and Detroit both have a history of manufacturing, very specialized things, and very, very diverse. Uh, Chicago managed to extract a knowledge economy, specialized servicing in anything that has to do with manufacturing, logistics, etc. And, um, and Detroit did not. Why? Because in Detroit, that enormous diversity of factories all geared to one sector controlled by a few large corporations, that de-urbanized the economy of Detroit. What you cannot have, a city is a very particular space. It is not an office park. So also this question of density. An office park is very dense, but it's not a city. It's an office park. Huh? So, so th what the city offers is this possibility of multiple firms winding up working together to produce something. A lot of networked economies inside the city. So now we know from that case and from other cases that you've got to have that in an urban economy if it's not going to somehow you know, become very elementary or die. Now, very quickly, I'm going to combine the two. These last two, the yep. Twitter and this one. So you say top down. That is the big challenge. How do we make workable instruments, channels, etc., where the the vast majority of you know the neighborhood, the, the 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 individual home, whatever you know, the citizenry, which can also articulate in the form of neighborhoods or the, or the the economic district, whatever, you know, of a city, and the top, the government. Well, number one, we've got to eliminate a lot of existing law in most cities that I've looked at, which is not a lot, you know, but there's a lot of stuff that we don't need that is just bureaucracy and it's not good. But we also have to develop the instruments. As you heard me say, I'm one of those who believes that things are made. Justice is made, inequality is made, cities are made, you know, the making of. And so we need to make. Now at that point, with these new technologies, we have a lot of citizens who, it's not just that they have access to a, a technology that allows them to communicate what they have seen in the city that is wrong, you know, the, the what do we call it, the hole in the ground, the pot, the, hop, the pot, what do you call it? Yeah. The Bob pothole, Bible. the pothole, you know, the Boston, you know, where everybody, you know, it's an application that you have in, you say, pothole, fix, pothole, fix, otherwise, yeah. how can a city know where all the potholes are? You know, I mean, God, that would take an army, right? So, but what it does, and that is more important, more important it, it's not just about information, it mobilizes people. So some of the stuff that I was talking about, the environment before, these are people-centered activities also. You know, you have to paint all of those surfaces with the bacterium in it, so to speak. And so I think the citizen needs to be mobilized. And then we have the technologies that can fill in a bit of the gap, not everything. But then there is another cycle that has to happen, and that is making new regulations, enabling regulations, yeah. making new law also. Yeah. So anyhow. I think we're done, right? Well, I think we have time maybe for one quick last question uh, of the panel. If anyone has a burning issue that has yet yes, to be raised. Yes, I've a, seen that arm raised for a while. Yeah. <laughs>
kind of a strange question. But, um, I'm Patty Morsi. I work for the National Intelligence Council Strategic Futures Group, and I'm the U.S. Rep to the Global Futures Forum. And I, I've had sort of this nagging question about urbanization. I know there's data out there that shows mass urbanization trends, especially in the developing world. But I thought the assumption behind that was the driver is there's more opportunity, there's food there, there's clean water there. Um, so as people come in from really rural areas, not from suburbs, but really rural areas, I guess we could use China as an example, to find opportunity in the city, um, I feel like there's sort of a countervailing trend that um, is farther out um, strategically uh, that we need to look at in terms of how the smart grid enables people to move farther out um, and turn, get get you know renewable energy, um, localize uh, their production in terms of 3D printing, proliferating around and, and making products more locally available. Um, the fact that I have a daughter who's taking all online courses and we're only a mile away from the school where the courses are being offered, but she could be three hours away and it wouldn't matter. So we get it. So the bottom yeah. line is, it, we, I feel like there's two different tensions here. And so the, I guess the real question is, in terms of real research on what's driving urbanization, is, does that really support the long-term trend including the developing world towards greater urbanization, or is there potentially another trend that we're not there is. absorbing? Great, great, great <laughs> question. Quick responses uh, here at the very end. Okay, fine. So, so one trend, just in, in terms of why so many people are, especially as you said, in the global south, how about land grabs? After, when the crisis begins and, and financial firms are major buyers of land, not because they're about to become farmers, but because they make it liquid, Right, so two or six. You look, you know, buying land. I'm talking about big plots of land. We're talking millions of hectares huh, in each acquisition, and this is an old story. But two or six, the curve. I'm very, as a social scientist, I always look at curves. You know, the shape of curves. The curve goes like that, and. And 220 million hectares of land were bought by about 10 countries, including countries like Sweden and South Korea, and not just the usual Gulf countries, as people think, or China, and, and about uh, 100 plus firms in about uh, 28 countries. Those are major. There are little acquisitions as well. Now, just a, a moment, a concrete moment. When China buys 2.8 million hectares of land in Zambia to grow palm, what happens? It evicts floras and floras, sure, but it also evicts all kinds of rural economies. Some of them are actually rural manufacturing districts. It, it throws out, throws out. Where do those people go? To cities. So when people now talk about, which I'm so tired of that sentence, I think it's a sentence that we should drop. I will not say it, but now I have to say it to illustrate my point. So this is what happens. <laughs> last time. So this urbanizing, last time, that this urbanizing, when, when people talk about the urbanizing of the global population, there are too many non-urban things that are happening that have to be brought into the picture. And one of them is this, those people are being thrown out of their land there. So my little book, my new book is called Expulsions. And I look at a whole variety of projects, you know, where processes. So that is part of the story, besides all the other good things that you said. Um, Great. Well, 30 seconds each for Tim and, and Greg. I think we're just about at our okay, time Okay, so the, the, big, the big number is uh, most of the urban increases, uh, natural increase already, hap that already happens in cities because cities are so large. And so the, the immigration part in certain places, India and China, yeah, it's still, it still matters. But uh, in the global, this is an asymmetrical issue here. You know, in the global north, uh, you're at a stage now where technology does enable some de-urbanization. We, we see it happening all over the place in the U.S. But in the global south, not yet. Because you still need that propinquity, that face-to-face -face exchange. You have to get the finance. You have to understand where the opportunities are. You have to borrow from your neighbor. You have to, you know, the safety net 
is in the city. Okay, so that, that's the compelling reason why it's, I, it's still going to happen. And yet the happen. trend in Silicon Valley is to move to San Francisco and establish internet yes, headquarters for exactly. so many companies. So even in the face of that, you're still seeing something else. Right, so right. The Global North is different. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But that's the same regard. So I just come back to that. This goes back to the social networks thing. The reason people keep moving to cities is because that is where social networks happen. That is yeah. whether you're in, moving in an informal right. settlement and because other villagers right. or family members have moved there, so you can tap into those resources, or because you go there to Silicon Valley because that's where the VC networks and other entrepreneurs are. This is my final point on that, you know, partly what you're asking is a question about dispersal. Are we, are we seeing centripetal and centrifugal forces? And you're arguing, are we seeing as a centrifugal one? And the answer is, I don't believe no. I wrote a book on air travel. I had, I had to defend the whole notion that air travel would continue increasing in a world where we'll have telepresence and everything else. And the answer is, is that there's never been a decline in air travel. And for every prediction the city would die, George Gilder in 95, McLuhan in the 70s, uh -huh. um, the, the, in fact, the opposite has happened because to echo this, we need propinquity, we need to meet face to face, we need those encounters, and we need those social networks of that. And so do I do think, I agree with you that like rural living will, will get more awesome, but it will not you know, be a countervailing <laughs> trend. It will be a pebble in the, in the stream, I think. Well, on that note, please join me in thanking our panel for a wonderful discussion on the future of cities. <laughs>